Hello everyone, so we're starting chapter 2 out of Griffith's introduction to quantum mechanics. And chapter 2 is all about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So we're going to get into that, and if you wouldn't mind please giving me a thumbs up and subscribing. I'm trying to build my channel up, so any help you can give would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so we're going to start with 2.1, which is stationary states. Let me try to do this so I keep my microphone nearby. So we have Schrodinger's equation. I, H bar, the partial derivative of psi with respect to T, equals minus H bar squared divided by 2M. The second derivative of psi with respect to X plus our potential times psi. So again, if you remember from chapter one, this equation is kind of analogous to your Lagrangian or your uh, Newton's second law or Hamilton's equation. It's how we get information about our system. So what we want to do is actually solve this thing. And the way that we're going to solve it is using a method called separation of variables, which is, I think, one of the first methods you would learn in a PDE's course. So what we're going to assume is that psi, which is a function of x and t, can be written as a product of a function that depends only on position and another function that depends only on time so that they can be separated. So this might seem a little ridiculous at first because um, there's no reason to really input this sort of restriction. There should be solutions to the Schrodinger equation that are not in this form here. But if you stick with it at the end, you'll see why this is a good assumption to make. Okay. Well, now if we take a derivative of psi with respect to, say, t, you'll notice that the psi is a constant. So that'll just be psi. And then we have a derivative, a regular derivative now, of rho with respect to t. It's no longer a partial derivative because phi only depends on t. And did not want to do that. You can probably guess that if you take the second derivative of psi with respect to x, you're going to get something very similar. You're going to get rho times the second derivative of psi with respect to position. So now what we can do here is we can substitute this in for d psi t. Why is this acting up? That needs to go away. I don't really use that, so I don't know its purpose. And we can put this in for our second derivative. So if you do that, you'll have your i h bar psi and now an ordinary derivative of rho with respect to t is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m rho times the second derivative of psi with respect to position plus v times which notes fixed this setup psi times rho okay because again, we're claiming that your psi can be replaced with lowercase psi of x times rho of t. Okay? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides of this Schrodinger equation with these different variables by psi times rho psi times rho, psi times rho. 
and what you end up getting is i h bar times 1 over rho d rho dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m times 1 over psi the second derivative of psi with respect to x plus just our potential. Let's see. Maybe I can. There we go. Hopefully that fixes it. So again, all we did was a divide both sides of the equation by psi times rho. So now what we want to do, and what I want to do, is convince you that since this left side of the equation, which is just a function of t, is equal to this other function, which is a function of x, and remember, psi is a function of x, and so is our potential. Again, we're assuming our potential is not time dependent. That's one of the assumptions we made uh, earlier. But that is a situation we'll talk about later. But anyways, since we have a function that's only a function of time, is always equal to another function, which is only a function of position, then both of these functions have to be equal to some constant, which we're going to call e. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just consider some any old function of time. And as time passes, say you get some different value, different output. One, two, three, four, what have you. But that has to be equal to some other function, which is only a function of position. So if you were to change, and they have to be equal all the time. So if you were to change the time, take a different data point, it would have to be equal to every value of g of x. And then the next value of time would have to be equal to every value of g of x. So this can only really be true if they're not really functions of any variables, but they're just a constant, which is a function. So that's what they are, and we're going to call that constant e. So then i h bar times 1 over rho d rho dt is equal to the constant we're calling e. And this is a pretty easy differential equation to solve you can see that the derivative is equal to rho over i h bar e or minus rho i over h bar e which is usually how we end up writing it and this is a pretty simple differential equation to solve because you have a function times some constant equal to the derivative of the function. It's a very common one that comes up in physics. Rho of t is equal to the exponent e um, negative i e times t over h bar. Because if you take the derivative of it, you're just going to get this constant out here. Technically, there is a constant that goes with this, so it should really be a e to the minus i e t over h bar but we're going to be doing more things with constants so we're end up going to have just one constant at the very end of it so we're going to put them all together at the end as for the second equation minus h bar squared over 2m the second derivative of psi with respect to position plus the potential times psi is equal to e times psi. Okay, so that is going from here. If you imagine multiplying both sides by just psi, that's essentially what we've done. Now with this one, we can't solve for it like we did with rho of t because we haven't really specified what v of x is yet. And depending on what v of x is, that's going to dictate what our psi is going to be, our solution. And this is referred to as 
the time independent Schrodinger equation, or TISE. It's usually a good abbreviation. And this is a big deal because this is where we're going to spend a lot of time working with is solving the time independent Schrodinger equation for different potentials v of x. And in future videos, we're going to talk about the infinite square well, the potential well, the barrier, harmonic oscillator, delta function, all sorts of different potentials, which will give you some different size. So we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, solving for that. However, there is something we do need to talk about because, again, to get what we did, we made this assumption. And why was that a good assumption to make? You might say, okay, sure. There are solutions to the Schrodinger equation that are in the form some function of x times some function of time. But there's also solutions to the Schrodinger equation that are not in that form. So why are we just looking at this subset of solutions? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, psi is a function of x and t in this case. So psi of x e to the minus i e over h bar t. That's a function of position x and time t. But notice what happens if we square that. And remember, they're complex numbers, so that's essentially what we're doing. Well, you're going to get um, psi star e to the positive i e over h bar t times psi e to the minus i e over h bar t. And of course, the way that your exponents work, this and this are just one. So you just get the time independent Schrodinger equation squared. So that's important because this is our probability density. And the probability density is what we're really interested with our wave function. We're not so much interested in just the wave function. We're really interested in the probability density because that tells us things about operators and expectation values that we're going to find, such as momentum and position that we talked about before. So if we want to find the expectation value of any operator, call it q, that'll just be the integral of psi star. And then your operator, we're essentially just going to replug we're going to plug x and p. We're going to substitute that with just x and minus i h bar, the partial, or not the partial, the regular derivative with respect to x times psi dx. So this is something we talked about in a previous video, if you're unsure about that. But the important thing here is this is all a function of position, not time. So our time dependence is not going to be included in our expectation value. There is no time dependence. So that's number one. Number two is if we consider the Hamiltonian. So we're going to think of the Hamiltonian as just the total energy. So kinetic energy plus potential energy. This is just another way you could write your um, energy in terms of with P equals mv, and remember energy, or at least kinetic energy, is one half mv squared. Um, so anyways, that's our Hamiltonian. And if we want to find the operator, the Hamiltonian operator, remember all that we have to do is replace P. P hat is minus i h bar d by dx, and replace that with um, everywhere we see a p. Now it's kind of weird, but p squared is just this term squared. 
So negative i squared is positive i squared, which is negative 1. So minus 8 bar squared. And then this is what happens to our derivative operator. It's pretty weird because if you think about it, your derivative is, it's not really a number in the sense of, um, you know, this isn't saying to square something. This is how many times we're taking a derivative. But for right now, just know that the math works out to where it's the same way. It's similar with, um, what is that rule? Um, there is one rule in calculus, I remember. Oh, not calculus, but differential equations where you, let's just say you have something like, uh, maybe if you've taken differential equations, you've seen something like this. And you treat it like a fraction, kind of. And this is something you can solve. Even though that's not really a fraction, the real math that you do to make that work acts as a fraction. So anyways, our Hamiltonian then can be expressed as minus 8 bar squared over 2m the second derivative with respect to x plus v of x. Okay? And you might notice this is pretty close to the Schrodinger equation and if we multiply, or I should say, if the Hamiltonian acts on psi, so if you have a psi here, a psi here, well that's just one side of the Schrodinger equation which we know is equal to, in this case, e times psi. Kind of looks like if you've taken linear in eigen equation, which we'll get to later. And I actually have to take my wife to work, so I'll get to the rest of this in a little bit. Okay, so we're back now, and we'll go ahead and finish the section. So we just mentioned, we talked about our Hamiltonian operator, and how you can write your Schrodinger's equation in terms of the Hamiltonian operator. Now if we want to calculate the expectation value of this operator, the Hamiltonian, that's going to be equal to the integral of psi star, our operator, squeezed in between. And remember, this is equal to this. E is a constant, so I'm going to pull that outside. We have the integral of psi star psi dx, which we know to be 1. So this is then equal to just E. The other thing we want to look at is if we have the Hamiltonian operator squared acting on the wave function, which is the same thing as having your Hamiltonian operator act on the Hamiltonian operator after it's acted on the wave function. Now we already established this is e times psi. So then this is e, that can go out, it's a constant, times the Hamiltonian acting on psi. And once again this is e, so this is equal to just e squared. Okay? Or e squared psi I should say. Right, because this is actually equal to e times psi. Okay, so now we can find the expectation of the Hamiltonian squared is equal to the integral of psi star, the Hamiltonian squared acting on psi dx, but we just showed that this is equal to e times psi, e squared times psi. So this whole thing is e squared, the integral, psi star psi dx. And again, this integral has to be 1. Uh, this goes back to our probability video, if you're confused about that. So this is equal to e squared. Now, why did I find these expectation values? Well, the variance of our Hamiltonian squared is what we just found minus the expectation value of our Hamiltonian squared. 
So again, this is e squared minus, this is just e, so if we square that, it's e squared, so this is equal to zero, okay? But let's think back to our probability video. If you remember that little diagram I showed with the different graphs and how you know your mean, the number of elements, the average, uh, the mode, um, maybe not the mode, but all the other probability, probabilistic values in the two graphs were equal, but one ha had a much higher standard deviation and one kind of peaked. So if you remember, what this is telling us is how much our energy values are deviating from the average. But this is equal to zero. So that means there is no deviation from the average and you have these um, distinct energy levels that you're getting. There's no probability necessarily of well, what is energy level one. You know what that's going to be every single time. Same thing with E2, E3. These all correspond to different eigenstates. But whatever eigenstate you're looking at, the energy levels are going to be the same. They're not going to change from experiment to experiment. So that's actually quite good. So that's an interesting property of these solutions. But the third, and this is maybe the most important to people who were kind of skeptical we could write our uh, psi the way that we did, is one property for PDEs is you can write a general solution as a linear combination of all your solutions. So for example, we might have psi 1, which is psi 1 of x, e to the minus i e1 t over h bar. And you could have a psi 2 where we have a different time independent wave function and instead of E1 it's now E2 times T so on and so forth and you can create an infinite um, series of this so the most general solution you can get will be a linear combination of all your different solutions so this is a property of uh, differential equations. If you have two solutions, a sum of those solutions is also a solution. So we can write it as a sum. C sub n, so a linear combination can be, let's just say you have f of x, that can be, oops, uh, a times f of x say f1 plus a2 f of 2x so on so this c sub n is representing our coefficients here psi sub n of x and then e to the minus i e n t over h bar this kind of represents your different functions so even though we only snagged a portion of the solutions to Schrodinger's equation, we can use those to construct the general solution. So that's actually quite handy. Okay. Another thing that's important to note is psi oops, as a function of x when t equals 0 which just turns into n equals 1 to infinity c sub n psi sub n of x obviously if you let t be 0 then e to the 0 is just 1 okay so this is you could think of as your initial conditions or your initial wave function so in mechanics it's often helpful to know well what is x sub 0 equal to 
this is kind of analogous to that. All right. So that is important. And you can also think of it as our general solution here as just the summation of all our capital psi sub n x of t, which is exactly equivalent to this. OK? OK, so another thing to mention is, uh, let's just take a random state. We mentioned above that when we look at the probability density, your time dependence cancels out. So that was something we used, uh, we talked about a little before, that's important. But that's not quite the same as the whole series of solutions. So that's not necessarily true for this guy. This is a summation of your different energy states. And your different energy states, because you're going to have different values in your exponent, they're not necessarily going to cancel out like they would with our stationary states. So just to do a quick example, this is example 2.1 out of the textbook. We're given an initial condition, if you will, of C1 psi1 of x plus C2 psi2 of x. So this is a good way to kind of see what I'm talking about. So if you want to find the wave function, to begin with, you have to multiply your wave function by your time dependence. So we have C1 psi1 of x e to the minus i e1t over h bar plus C2 psi2 of x e to the minus i e2t over h bar okay so that is your wave function if we want to talk about the probability density which is what I was trying to make a point of up here when talking about the time dependence then we're interested in this quantity which would be psi star psi okay so psi star, we're going to change our negative sign here to a positive because that's what the conjugate is doing. And then we multiply that by just the ordinary wave function. So now our i's will be negative, since we're no longer taking the complex conjugate. And thankfully, there's only two terms here, n equals 2 in this case. But you could see how this would be messy if there was more, but it still, I think, um, demonstrates what's important. Now, if we distribute this out, Okay, fair enough. When we multiply here by here, your time dependence cancels. So you're left with C1 squared psi1 of x squared. But then when you multiply your C1 psi1 by C2 psi2, well, they're not necessarily canceling. So when you distribute this, um, this will be C2 squared psi 2 squared of x and then we're going to add our cross terms which would be plus 2 c1 psi 1 psi 2 e and then you can factor out uh, an i t over h bar and you would be left with e2 minus e1 
So you would, you would have something like, um, I'll just write it all the way out here. You would have I uh, E1 T over H bar. Then you would have E, let's actually just distribute this really quick. So you would have, um, C1, C2, Psi 1x, Psi 2x, and then you would have this E term. So that would be E to the I T over H bar, and then that's what E1 minus E2. So that comes from here, and then when you multiply here, you get C1, C2, Psi 1x, Psi 2x, oops, E to the I T over H bar, and then E2 minus E1, okay. Now, what will be helpful here is to remember that e to the i theta is equal to i sine theta plus cosine theta. In this case, our theta is like i, I'm sorry, not i, is like t over h bar. If we look at this term e1 minus e2. So that would be what we could plug in for here. Um, and then the other term would be t over h bar e2 minus e1. Okay, so let's see. Oop. c1 squared, sine 1 of x squared, plus c2 squared, psi 2 of x squared, plus c1, c2, psi 1 of x, psi 2 of x, times, we'll plug in over here, you have i sine of t over h bar, e1 minus e2, uh, plus cosine of t over h bar, e1 minus e2. Okay. Then we're going to have plus c1, c2, psi1 of x, psi2 of x, times i times sine of t over h bar, and then instead of e1 minus e2, it's e2 minus e1, plus cosine of t over h bar, e2 minus e1. And what we're going to do here is take advantage of the fact that this is equal to minus i sine of t over h bar e1 minus e2. So we're taking advantage of the fact that sine is odd, and you'll see that cancels with this term here, because they're the exact same term, just opposite sides. Over here we take advantage of the fact that cosine is even, so this is the same thing as if we just factor it out a negative, no big deal. Cosine's even. So you get two co uh, cosine terms. So long story short, this whole thing simplifies to just two cosine terms. So plus 2 C1, C2, Psi1 of X, Psi2 of X, cosine of 
over h bar e2 minus e1 or however it was we ended up doing that I think we ended up or the way the book does it I think they do it the other way but again this is equivalent to cosine of t over h bar e1 minus e2 so it doesn't it doesn't really matter because cosine's even but that's essentially what's going on here okay um, just to finish off here I don't really want to talk too much about this because we'll be talking about it later but the coefficients here c sub n what that represents is the probability that a measurement is going to return a particular energy level so for example it's the pro this is the probability you would find the energy in the first state and then this would be the probability that you find it in the second state or that you measure the second state energy level because again remember our wave function is a linear combination of different states so what energy level corresponding to which state will you actually measure this is one area where I think some people get confused because above I mentioned that these are distinct energy levels that are um, there's no variance in the energy levels that's to say every time you measure an energy level in a particular state you're guaranteed to get that energy level there's no uncertainty there but this is the energy levels of all the different states psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 so on and so forth so just a little thing that i've seen people get caught up on before i got caught up on it at first so that's something to consider and the expectation value of your hamiltonian is the summation of all possible energy levels because we know that there's going to be at least some energy level. So if you sum up all the probabilities, um, the sum of all the probabilities squared from n equals 1 to infinity is equal to 1. So there's never not going to be an energy level. This is essentially what that's saying. So then this is our expectation value. Okay, well that's it for stationary states. Pretty soon we're going to start talking about different systems like the infinite square well, harmonic oscillator, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Before we do that, I'm going to include some solutions in this playlist for 2.1 and 2.2. 2.2, if you remember, um, we made a bit of an assumption about the energies being real and not imaginary. So when we first called our constant E, you could have picked anything. If you knew E meant energy, then you might be able to reason through that E is real. But if, you've not, if you didn't know that ahead of time, who's to say that E is not complex? But it turns out that if E is not real, then you don't have a normalizable wave function. And if you remember, we discard those. So that's a pretty good one to go over. And then 2.1 proves a bunch of theorems about wave functions that are helpful. So I'm going to include those, they're worth looking over, and then we'll go through the infinite square well. If this was helpful at all, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and like. I really hope to build my channel one day and have a little bit of an audience, so I, I'd really appreciate it.